Welcome to Speak Words. I'm Daniel Isengard. Today I'm going to read an excerpt from the novel Extinction by the Austrian writer Thomas Bernhardt. Born in Holland in 1931 and raised in Austria and Germany, Thomas Bernhard was one of the most successful but also most contested writers of his generation. His writing style combined a highly musical approach based on variations on a theme with an excessively dark nihilism. Many of his novels, including Extinction, his last novel published in 1986, are constructed as inner monologues, often described as long-winded rants about the monstrosity of humankind in general and the Austrian people and their culture in particular. His protagonists often seem to revel almost masochistically in the futility of any kind of ambition or, in fact, life itself. His novels could be described as an acquired taste, a somewhat perverse pleasure to read, rendered all the more intriguing by his very elegant use of the fugue technique that drags the reader further and further down into the vortex of negativity, to a point where the narration becomes so absurd in its absolute denial of any possibilities of happiness that the effect lands you at the other end of the spectrum, where a sort of disturbed laughter may very well be your only recourse to protect yourself against a vitriolic, but always stylish, onslaught of attacks, put-downs and damning dissections of virtually all characters, including the often highly subjective and thus unreliable narrator. In Extinction, as often in Bernhard's novels, the protagonist is obsessively trying to come to terms with a highly critical situation of the present by mercilessly dissecting his past. In this case, the narrator is the son of a wealthy land-owning Austrian family who left his family's imposing estate called Wolfsegg and now, expatriated in Rome and working as a private tutor of literature, learns that his parents and older brother have passed away in a tragic car accident. This is taking place just as he has returned to Rome from a visit to Wolfsegg and had made up his mind to not go back for a long time or perhaps even cut all ties with his family. The unfolding inner monologue is not just a close analysis of his now dead parents and brother, but also his two surviving sisters and the trauma they all inflicted on him, but a damnation of his own incapability to overcome the trauma, which he has been trying to explain to his one student in Rome named Gambetti, himself the son of a wealthy Italian family. This inner monologue unfolds as he's sitting at his desk in his apartment in Rome, examining three photographs he has kept of his family, one of his parents, one of his brother, and one of his two sisters. The title Extinction points to the protagonist's deep conviction that the only way to bring about a better world is to burn down, or, as it were, extinguish the old. Looking at the family photographs, I reflected that our calculations do not always work out, because an accident can throw everything into disarray. The mocking faces of my sisters on the photo taken in Cannes actually are my sisters. I only ever see them as these mocking faces, whenever and wherever I see them, and whatever the state of our relations, I see only these mocking faces. These are what come to mind whenever I think of my sisters. It is these mocking faces that I keep in the drawer of my desk in Rome, not the various other faces they have, their sad, proud, disdainful and downright arrogant faces. No, only these mocking faces. I once told Gambetti that when I spoke of my sisters, I was speaking not of my sisters as such, but only of their mocking faces, captured by chance in this photograph. If they were dead, I told myself, I'd have nothing left of them but their mocking faces. 
In my dreams, I hear them laugh, and sometimes, as I walk through Rome, I suddenly hear this curious laughter of theirs, with its confident assurance of longevity, and I at once see their mocking faces, nothing else. They say something, and I think about what they've said, and I see their mocking faces. They take after their mother, I tell myself, who has a similarly mocking face that becomes hideously grotesque when duplicated in my sister's. I have often tried to rid myself of their mocking faces, to transform them into faces that don't mock, but I've never succeeded. I have no sisters, I told myself, only their mocking faces. There's no Cecilia and no Amalia, only two mocking faces, frozen forever in this hideous picture. They wanted to look young and beautiful, to project an image of happiness, I told myself as I studied the picture. But in this photo, they are ugly. And though still very young, they don't look young. They look quite old and present a profoundly unhappy image to photographic posterity. Had they known that nothing would remain but their mocking faces and this unhappy image, they wouldn't have let themselves be photographed. But they insisted on it, I told myself. I recall quite clearly that they wanted to be photographed. They posed for the picture and pressed close to each other in a simulation of happiness, spontaneity, and innate naturalness. Yet it was all appallingly artificial and unnatural, and the result was a cruel distortion. I remember not wanting to take the picture. I'm not to blame for this cruel photograph, I told myself. They're to blame for insisting on my taking it and so forcing their mocking faces on me for the term of my natural life, so to speak, though neither they nor I could have known this at the time. Since then, I've never been able to escape their mocking faces. Every attempt has failed. At one point, it occurred to me to destroy the photo, to tear it up or burn it, but it seemed ludicrous to resort to destroying something so quintessentially ridiculous and trivial, and so I put it back in the drawer with the others. It's not my sisters who haunt me day and night, I told myself. It's their mocking faces, which give me no peace and often torment me for days or weeks on end. By using the devilish device of photography, we capture just one of the millions and billions of moments in the lives of two people and then spend a lifetime blaming these two people for this one moment that reveals their mocking faces. But I do have sisters, I told myself, not just their mocking faces. And this absurd thought made me clap my hand to my forehead. I have sisters at Wolfsack. Not just two mocking faces that seem hostile to me in every way. One of these two mocking faces is now married, as I had to say in order to avoid inconsistency, to the wine cork manufacturer from Freiburg. This comic character whose head seems far too small for his heavy build and substantial girth. One of the mocking faces now has a husband, but the other hasn't. And because of this, the one without a husband has withdrawn to the gardener's house, hating its companion piece for having married, all of a sudden, overnight, as it were. However, I have never succeeded in seeing my sister's mocking faces separately. However hard I've tried, I've only ever seen them as a pair. The photo shows two mocking faces, I told myself. But do my sisters really have such mocking faces? Or did they just have them at that one moment in Cannes when the picture was taken? Possibly they had them only for that one moment, I told myself, and never again. Yet now I believe they've always had them. Photography really is the devil's art, I told myself. 
for years, for decades, indeed for a whole lifetime, it forces us to see mocking faces that actually existed only once, for a single moment, when we acted on a sudden impulse and casually took a snapshot. And this sudden impulse then has a devastating lifelong effect that cannot be switched off and sometimes drives us to the verge of despair. I can't switch off these mocking faces of my sisters any longer, I once told Gambetti, to whom I've often spoken in a no doubt distasteful manner about my sisters' mocking faces, which have always played a large part in my life since I took this fatal photo, as I've often called it. So far, I've been talking about the mocking faces of my sisters, which I can't switch off and expel from my mind, I told Gambetti. But we have the same experience with other photos, though its effect may be less drastic, with photos of well-known and famous people whom we regard as important. Just think of the photo of Einstein sticking his tongue out. I can no longer visualize Einstein without his tongue sticking out, Gambetti, I said. I can't think of Einstein without seeing his tongue, that cunning, malignant tongue stuck out at the whole world, indeed the whole universe. And I can only see Churchill with his lower lip distrustfully thrust forward. The likelihood is that Einstein only once stuck his tongue out in that cunning, malignant manner, and that Churchill only once thrust his lower lip forward in such an expression of distrust on the occasion when the particular photo was taken. Yet, when I read Churchill's writings, I told Gambetti, I constantly see him with his lower lip thrust forward. And when I read something by Einstein, I'm completely obsessed with his tongue, stuck out at the whole world, the whole universe. I even fancy that it was not Churchill who wrote his memoirs, but his distrustfully prominent lower lip. Not Einstein who made those earth-shaking pronouncements, but his malignantly protruding tongue. I once considered whether I could free myself from the mocking faces of my sisters Amalia and Cecilia by writing a piece about them. But I naturally rejected the idea as one of the absurdest I've ever entertained. I'll never be able to free myself from my sisters' mocking faces, I told Gambetti. I'll have to live with them for the rest of my life. It might, of course, be incredibly useful to write a piece entitled The Mocking Faces of My Sisters. But what would be the point? I'd have to endure the most extreme boredom in order to write such a piece, Gambetti. I was always prevented from doing so by these mocking faces, which have never given me any peace for as long as I can remember. It would, of course, be foolish to think I'd be rid of them if I tore the photo up or threw it in the stove or cut it into a thousand fragments. They'd torment me all the more. And my parents in the second photo don't make a good impression either. Only a pathetic, ridiculous, comic impression as they board the Dover train at Victoria Station in London. No luggage, just their Burberry umbrellas on their arms. And my father in his thirties knickerbockers, which he bought before the war in Vienna at Habeck's elegant store in the Kärntnerstrasse. He went around them throughout the Nazi period. For as far back as I can remember, I've seen him wearing these knickerbockers, I told myself. Even when he's wearing something quite different, I still see him in these knickerbockers from Harvick's, constantly saying, Heil Hitler! They were probably very expensive because they never wore out. They're actually quite smart, I told myself, but not on my father. On him, they look ridiculous. He wore these knickerbockers when he received the Gauleiter of Salzburg at the entrance to the farmyard and then led him straight to the stables, believing that this would make the best impression on him, immediately proving that Wolfsegg was a great estate and he a great landowner. And he wore these knickerbockers to receive the archbishops, which was tasteless but in keeping with the Nazi period. 
There they were, boarding the train in London, my mother stretching out her neck so that her hat perched precariously on her head, probably held by a single hat pin. Why have I only this picture of my parents in my desk and no other, I asked myself. This comic, ridiculous picture that shows my parents as comic, ridiculous people and not some other on which they're not comic and ridiculous. Most of the time they were quite different. Not at all comic and ridiculous, but severe, forbidding, cold and calculating. While their Burberry umbrellas hang vertically from their arms, their bodies are inclined, as is normal when boarding a train. The main reason for their looking so comic and ridiculous in this photo is the combination of the inclination of their bodies with their vertical umbrellas. The law of gravity is what makes them comic and ridiculous, though they naturally did not know this when they were photographed. They did not want to be photographed, but they were photographed by me. I once had hundreds of photos of my parents, but I've destroyed them all or thrown them away. This is the only one I kept and put in my desk, the one in which they appear comic and ridiculous. Why? I asked myself. I probably wanted to have comic and ridiculous parents in the photo I was going to keep, I told myself. I also wanted to have a photo of my brother that showed him not as he really was, but as I wanted to see him, in a ridiculous pose on his sailboat on the Wolfgangsee, an undoubtedly good-looking man who was made to look ridiculous, insignificant and unnatural, not to say foolish and helpless, so that he could not be taken seriously. I only ever wanted this one photo of my brother in which he looks ridiculous, I told Gambetti. I wanted to have a comic, ridiculous brother, just as I wanted to have comic, ridiculous parents and no sisters at all. Only their mocking faces. That's the truth, Gambetti. There is a devilish streak in us that manifests itself in such trifles, as we like to call them, in such trivialities as the photographs we collect, which reveal how base and despicable and shameless we are. And for no other reason than that we are weak. For if we are honest, we have to admit that we ourselves are far weaker than those we wish to see as weak, far more ridiculous than those we wish to see as ridiculous, comic and characterless. It is primarily we, not they, who are characterless, ridiculous, comic and unnatural Gambetti. By keeping only these photos of my family and no others, and what's more, in my desk, so that I can look at them whenever I wish, I am documenting my own baseness, my own shamelessness, my own lack of character. I have only to open the drawer of my desk in order to gloat over my impossible sisters, the ridiculous appearance of my parents, and the pathetic posture of my brother. I have only to take out these photos and look at them in order to fortify myself in an axis of weakness and console myself with what I'm bound to describe as my own baseness. This shows how low one can sink. We describe others as base and contemptible and adduce every possible argument in support of our case. Yet the description applies even more alarmingly to ourselves. Instead of hiding ourselves in the desk drawer as we ought, in the form of some comic and ridiculous photo, we hide our family there, so that when the need arises we can misuse them for our own utterly base ends, I told Gambetti. And naturally, I said, there are people who keep photos showing their relatives in a good light. But I am not one of these. I keep only comic and ridiculous photos, as I am fundamentally a weak person, a thoroughly weak character. 
although every photo is a vulgar falsification, there are some that we keep out of respect and affection for the persons they depict, and others that we put in our desks or hang on our walls for unworthy motives, out of hatred for the subjects. Unfortunately, I have to own that my motives belong to the second category. At a certain age, I said, when we're about 40, we often manage to present ourselves as we really are, with all our contemptible traits, something we wouldn't have dreamed of doing earlier. From then on, we occasionally allow alarming glimpses of our inner selves. At my age, Gambetti, we have to a large extent drawn back the curtains that for decades were drawn so closely that we almost suffocated behind them. One day they'll be fully drawn back, I said. How will my sisters react, I wondered, when I confront them as executor and heir? Will they receive me as insolently as ever? I dared not pursue this question and took care not to. The surviving beneficiaries, my sisters and I, I thought. The surviving beneficiaries are the very people whom no one thought of as survivors. They always thought I would soon die. A victim of what they called my breathlessness somewhere or other, but not at Wolf's Egg. It's possible, even probable, I now thought, that they always expected to receive a telegram informing them that I had died. And my sisters have survived, the two people who didn't matter at all in any serious sense, because according to my mother they were totally unimportant. But I never expected a telegram telling me that my parents were dead. Lots of people are afraid of receiving such a telegram, but I never was. Millions of people, I had often told Gambetti, live in daily dread of getting a telegram telling them that someone they love and respect has died. I've never been afraid of getting such a telegram. Seeing photographs like those on my desk, we think that the people depicted in them at least pose no danger to us. But they may in fact pose the utmost danger, mortal danger. The people in the photographs, at most four inches high, don't even contradict us. We attack them and they don't defend themselves. We can say anything we like to their faces and they don't move. This drives us to fury, to ever greater fury. We curse the figures in the photographs because they refuse to answer back or respond in any way, when there's nothing we hope for, nothing we crave so much as a response. Contending with microscopic dwarfs, as it were, we become demented. We lash out at microscopic dwarfs and drive ourselves utterly crazy. We let ourselves get so carried away that we hurl insults at heads only half an inch in diameter gambetti, and so make ourselves quite ridiculous. I look at my parents in the photo of them boarding the Dover train at Victoria Station in London and insult them. What ridiculous creatures you always were, I say, without realizing how ridiculous that makes me, far more ridiculous than my parents could ever be or ever have been, Gambetti. You idiot, I say to my brother, not quite four inches tall. You perverse creatures, I say to my sisters, who measure less than three inches on the terrace at Cannes. To take a photograph of a person is to mock him, Gambetti. And by the same token, all who take photographs, even if they do it professionally and achieve the greatest artistry, are nothing but mockers of humanity. Photography is the greatest mockery in the world, the ultimate mockery of the world. But today, I told Gambetti, there are a hundred times more people in photographs than there are in reality, than natural people, in other words. That should give us pause. 
Am I glad, I said to Gambetti two days ago on returning from Wolfsegg, to be back here, to have escaped from the north and its imbecilities for a while, from the clutches of my family, above all from my mother's excited moods, my father's constant carping, and the Austrian weather. For three quarters of the year, we have bad weather. And when we think spring has come, it's months before it's really there, only to merge at once into summer. And the summers get shorter and shorter. And the fall, which is actually the most beautiful season, causes trouble for all who suffer from gout or rheumatism in Austria, where bad weather predominates. Reminding them with its frequent storms and the icy cold that comes even in October that their existence is constantly threatened. To say nothing of the winters, which make everything unendurable for anyone over 30. People here don't appreciate the unique climate they live in, but long for the cool north, the fire trees, the mountain lakes, the refreshing Alps. You see, Gambetti, some people yearn for the south and others for the north with the result that they're all more or less equally discontented. But at present, I enjoy this refreshing but warm air, these noisy but carefree people, I said. At Wolfsegg I wore my winter coat, but here I go round in an open-necked shirt with my sweater around my shoulders. That's the difference. People are not weighed down here with pounds of clothing, heavy shoes, heavy jackets and thick felt hats. They walk around in the lightest of clothes and eat out of doors nearly all year round. Not for a long time, I could still hear myself exclaiming, meaning that I would not be returning to Wolfsegg for a long time. But this telegram now compels me to return in the shortest possible time. Obvious though this was, I sought to delay the inevitable by doing nothing, by simply sitting at my desk and looking at the photographs. I continued to contemplate them and submit them to minute scrutiny. I spread the telegram out beside them so that I would have its short message announcing the deaths in front of me all the time. I repeatedly spelled out the message until I felt I would go mad. My brother, unlike me, was a calm person. At Wolfsegg I had always been the restless spirit, but he was the soul of calm. My parents always referred to him as the contented one and me as the malcontent. If we got in trouble, it was always my fault, never his. They believed his explanations, not mine. If, for example, I lost money that had been entrusted to me for some reason, they refused to believe I had lost it, despite all my asseverations. They preferred to believe that I had pocketed it and only pretended to have lost it. But if my brother said he had lost some money, they believed him. If he told them that he had lost his way in the wood, they instantly believed him. But if I told the same story, they refused to believe me. I always had to justify myself at great length and in great detail. On one occasion, my brother pushed me into the pond behind the children's villa. Whether intentionally or not, he pushed me in while passing me at the edge of the pond where the wall is not wide enough for two people to pass. I had the greatest difficulty keeping my head above water and not going under. I actually thought I was going to drown. And I also thought that my brother might have pushed me in on purpose, not inadvertently out of clumsiness. This thought tormented me as I struggled for dear life in the pond. My brother could not help me without risking his own life. He naturally made many attempts, but failed. The pond is deep, and the child is bound to go under and drown if he can't keep himself on the surface, I told Gambetti. Just as I felt sure I was going to drown, 
I caught hold of a ring fixed to the wall below the surface, which was used for mooring the little boats we had on the pond, and managed to clamber out. When I got home, my parents wanted to know why I was completely soaked. Instead of telling the truth, I lied to protect my brother, saying that I had accidentally fallen into the pond. They at once accused me of having deliberately jumped into the pond in order to get my brother in trouble. When I said no, I had fallen in by accident, they called me a liar and drew my brother close to them as if to protect him, while I was packed off to the kitchen to be dressed in fresh dry clothes. Throughout this scene, my brother remained silent. He did not say a word. He did not tell the truth or even say that I was not to blame for falling into the pond. He watched the whole sorry scene without attempting to explain anything or put me in a better light. He just pressed his head against my mother's skirt as if for protection. And this made things even worse for me. If I fell and tore my socks, they scolded me for tearing my socks but did not think of comforting me because I had grazed my knee and was bleeding and in pain. Instead, they scolded me for hours. And in the evening, when I had forgotten about the mishap, they scolded me again, as if it gave them pleasure to make me cry. They comforted my brother if he hurt himself even slightly, but they never comforted me, even if I hurt myself badly. They repeatedly scolded me because they thought I visited the gardeners too often and for too long. They disapproved of my spending time with the gardeners, who supposedly had a bad influence on me. They wanted me to spend my time with the huntsmen, who were thought to have a good influence. But I hated the huntsmen, as I have said, and always went to see the gardeners, whom I loved. I was scolded whenever it transpired that I had been with the gardeners, and they were scolded too for paying attention to me, because their company was considered very harmful to me, as my mother put it. Whenever my brother visited the huntsmen, they would say, It's nice that you've been with the huntsmen. That's what we like to see. And they always said it in my hearing when they were sure of hurting me. Once, when I had been with the huntsmen, because for some reason I wanted to go and see them, I cannot recall why, they asked me where I had been, and I told them I had been with the huntsmen. They did not believe me, and boxed my ears in the presence of my brother, who knew that I had been with the huntsmen, as he had gone with me, but instead of coming to my aid and telling them the truth, he kept quiet. He always kept quiet even when our mother boxed my ears because I had told what she took to be a lie when in fact it was the truth. I recall that even when I grew up, my parents never believed me. If someone had been to see me, they would ask the name of the visitor, but when I told them, they refused to believe me, saying that they knew very well who had been to see me and it was not the person I said it was. If I had been to Wells, and they asked me where I had been, I would tell them, whereupon they would say that I had not been in Wells. They knew where I had really been, in Föcklerbrück, in Linz, in Styria, but not in Wells. They could never be persuaded of the truth. They never believed anything I told them. They considered me to be not just a normal liar, but, as my mother used to say, a born liar. What do you do all the time in the library, they would ask, when I emerged from one of our five libraries, all of which were suspect, as I was the only person to use them. You certainly don't go there to read, they would say, and take me to task. It was no good assuring them that I went to the library only to read. You go to the library to pursue your perverse thoughts, my mother would insist. No matter how often I protested that I went to the library to read and for no other purpose and that I did nothing else there. I repeatedly swore that I went to the library only to read, that I spent my time there reading. She would not be convinced but called me a liar.
and repeatedly maintained that I had gone to the library to pursue my perverse thoughts. When I asked her what she meant by my perverse thoughts, she refused to answer but called me a troublemaker, as she had so often since my early childhood. She added that I was an impudent liar and walked off. She constantly suspected me of pursuing perverse thoughts. She probably had no idea what she meant by this, but it became a stock reproach. And even in company, I was not safe from it. At dinner, in the presence of strangers, usually the kind of guests I found most repugnant, middle-class people from the neighboring small towns whom she had known since childhood and still kept up with, she would say that I was always pursuing my perverse thoughts. I have to say that my mother loved my brother, Johannes, above all because he never felt any need to visit the libraries. Johannes, she would say, doesn't go to the library to pursue perverse thoughts. He goes to the huntsman's lodge where it's fun. In my view, based on experience, the fun at the huntsman's lodge was of a fairly basic and vulgar variety consisting in the endless recital of crude and utterly vulgar jokes that I could never find amusing without feeling dirty. This was the main reason that I abhorred the Huntsman's Lodge, whereas my mother always enjoyed the crude, basic and abysmally primitive jokes that circulated at the Huntsman's Lodge. Nothing delighted her more, and she always left the Huntsman's Lodge with tears of laughter in her eyes, which on one occasion even my father called perverse. You go to the gardener's house, she used to say to me, where it's all so boring. That's typical. She thought nothing of spending half the night with the huntsmen, joining in their brainless songs, pressing up close to them on a bench, and permitting them to make unequivocal verbal passes at her. Indeed, as the evening progressed, she would not object to their making physical passes, or even, I have to say, pinching her bottom. When my brother had finished his homework, he was always told he had done well. But when I had finished mine, they always found something to criticize, noticing a mistake here, an irregularity there, and constantly upbraiding me for what they called my illegible writing. If my brother came home with a good mark, they naturally praised him, but in my case, a good mark was acknowledged only by a reluctantly friendly nod. I recall that my brother was given the best bed linen, unlike the worn sheets that I had to sleep on, and first-class pillows, unlike mine, which were patched and mended. My stockings, coats, and jackets had to last longer than his. His clothes were replaced when they became dirty or had unsightly holes in them, but it was no use my asking for new clothes. If I did, I was called a wastrel, but they never called my brother a wastrel. I do not think my parents ever treated me fairly, for even in my early childhood they had a feeling that I might be superior to them, though I cannot say exactly what prompted this feeling. Only my grandparents were fair to me. They treated me just as they treated Johannes. For them, there was no difference between their grandsons, or at least, they made no difference between us. Our happiest times at Wolfsegg were when our grandparents were alive. This was natural, I once told Gambetti, as they showed no favoritism. As soon as they died, I became aware that my parents wished to punish me because they thought my grandparents had treated me better than my brother. This was not true, but it was what my parents always imagined, especially my mother. It was as though our parents, after the death of our grandparents, had thought to themselves, now we must turn our attention to Johannes, who had a raw deal from his grandparents. We must treat him particularly well, because he was always put down by his grandparents and had to suffer from the favoritism they showed to his brother. The truth is that my brother was never put down by our grandparents, nor was I ever shown favoritism. 
Our parents, however, believing that I had been at an advantage and my brother at a disadvantage, decided that from now on I should be made to pay for what they imagined to have been the case, though it bore no relation to the truth. And so, once our grandparents were dead, our parents always treated Johannes with affection and me with aversion. And in due course, the favoritism they showed him became unbearable, and its effect was compounded by the aversion they showed to me. They became accustomed, in short, to loving my brother and hating me. It's absurd, I had told Gambetti on the Pincho, that in a house that boasts five libraries, the mind should be held not only in low regard, but in positive contempt. I have to suppose that one library was not enough for those who built Wolfsecken were its first occupants. They had a natural need for thought and intellectual activity and were undoubtedly passionate thinkers who were devoted to mental endeavor and made thinking their chief preoccupation, as so much of the evidence we have about them shows. They were convinced that the consummation of human existence was to lead a life of thought, a life centered on the mind, Gambetti, not one bounded by everyday concerns and everyday stolidity, as my family believed. What times those were, when understanding was elevated to the plane of thought, and to think was the supreme imperative. Today, everything that once distinguished Wolfsegg has atrophied, having been consciously belittled by successive generations and actually trodden in the dirt in the past century, above all in recent decades. They provided themselves not just with one library, but with five, I told Gambetti. The upper left library, the upper right, the lower left, the lower right, and the one in the children's villa. For centuries, all branches of learning were represented in them, all schools of thought, all the arts. On one occasion, Gambetti, I had retired to the upper left library, to read Jean Paul's Sieben case, which was incidentally one of Uncle Georg's favorite books. Poring over it for hours, I gradually forgot everything around me, including the fact that at the time I was supposed to be helping my mother sort her mail. I had forgotten that on alternate Saturdays I had to go to her riding room, as it was called, at six o'clock in the evening, to sort her letters. Sieben case had made me forget everything, including my mother's instructions. Every Saturday between six and seven she used to sit in her writing room and have either me or my brother sort the letters that had arrived during the week into the exact order of their receipt. Having sorted them, I had to put them in a certain spot on her desk. While sorting the letters, I was able to have a quiet talk with my mother which was not possible at any other time. She would meanwhile deal with her correspondence and give me a chance to consult her on various matters, although she never liked it when I asked what she considered importunate questions. I was allowed to do so while sorting the mail, and she was prepared to answer them. This routine of sorting the mail in the writing room during the brief hour before supper gave me my one opportunity to get close to my mother. Sometimes she herself would address a kind, even affectionate word to me. As I sorted the mail, I often felt that I loved my mother. Indeed, that I loved her dearly. As I looked at her from the side, her face seemed beautiful, though at other times I was put off by its ordinariness. The feeble light cast by the lamp on her desk was flattering and showed her face to advantage, I told Gambetti on the Pincio. When I had sorted the letters, she would sometimes look up from her correspondence and place her hand on my head, almost tenderly. Then, as though instantly ashamed of this gesture, she would withdraw her hand and dismiss me. 
She would take her hand away and promptly return to her correspondence, as though suddenly realizing that I was not Johannes. But I wanted to tell you something else, Gambetti. It was nine o'clock when, having ensconced myself in the upper left library to read Siebenkäs and forgotten all about sorting the mail, I suddenly woke up, as it were, in a state of alarm, and put the book aside. I left the library, which, as you know, was more or less off-limits, and went down to join the others, who had long since finished supper. For five hours I had been rooted to my seat in the library, reading Siebenkäs and had forgotten not only about the mail, but also about supper. I came downstairs, Gambetti, to find them all sitting in the green drawing room, waiting for me. I was received in silence. After a while, during which my brother waited in gleeful anticipation of what was about to happen, my mother took me to task without so much as looking at me demanding to know where I had been, why I had not turned up to sort the mail, and how it was that I had put the finishing touch to my customary insolence by not only ignoring the sorting of the mail, but also failing to appear for supper. There was no excuse, she said, or at least none that she could imagine, for ignoring my obligation to sort the mail and leaving them to have supper without me. They had all been extremely worried about my whereabouts, she said, thinking of all the dreadful things that could have happened to me. Did I realize what terrible anxiety I had caused her? You have no excuse whatever for not turning up to sort the mail and for missing supper, she said. She still had not deigned to look at me. Then she rounded on me and said, You're a monster. If I'm not mistaken, you've been in the library. And what have you been doing there? You've been pursuing your perverse thoughts again.